For this video, I'm going to be talking about how to cross clock domains inside of an FPGA. It's not terribly easy, so this might be a longer video, but let's get into it. I tried to break it down and make it as simple as possible. So what is a clock domain, first of all? A clock domain refers to all sequential logic, so that's your flip-flops and your block RAM that run at any particular clock frequency, 100 megahertz, 50 megahertz, 200 megahertz. Occasionally, you might need multiple clock domains inside of one FPGA. Maybe you run your main logic at 78 megahertz, but you have an SD RAM interface that runs at 200 megahertz, and you need to send data from your main clock to the SD RAM, some off-chip off memory or something. Um, so you might need multiple clock domains inside your FPGA. And you need to be very careful with how you cross clock domain boundaries. And the reason that you need to be careful is that Setup and hold times cannot be guaranteed across, across clock boundaries. And I'll get into the details of that. You can corrupt your data, you can lose data, you will lose data. Um, the tools will complain, they'll give you a bunch of timing errors. We'll talk about how to fix some of those. And uh, I'm gonna discuss three different scenarios here. So going from a slow clock domain to a fast clock domain and how to solve that problem. Going from a fast clock domain to a slow clock domain. And then going using FIFOs to with, to cross clock domains with lots of data. And I'll discuss each one of those individually, so um, try to break it down that way, because they have different solutions depending on, there's no, uh, there's no quick fix for this, so you gotta kinda consider each problem independently. So first of all, setup hold metastability. So setup time and hold time, uh, perhaps you've heard of these, if not, brief review. Time before the clock edge, when data must be unchanging, is setup time. So if data comes in on the D input of your flip-flop and your clock edge is coming in on this greater than sign here, the setup time is the amount of time that the D input needs to be stable before the clock edge comes along. If it's not stable, so if D is changing right before this clock edge, you can't guarantee that uh, the, the flip-flop is gonna see the correct data. And on the, on after the clock edge comes along, the data must be stable. Uh, for some amount of time, that's called hold time. So setup time is before the clock edge, hold time is after the clock edge. As long as the data is stable for greater than setup time, greater than hold time, you can guarantee that you're okay. If it's not stable, then you get a metastable condition, and that's a bad thing, and basically what metastability is, is you don't know if the data is gonna be zero or one uh, for that particular flip-flop, and that can be bad. You generally want to know what's happening with your data inside your FPGA. So let's fix this problem in three ways. So first way, crossing from a slow clock domain to a fast clock domain, crossing from 10 to 20 megahertz, for example. This, this is a simple solution here. All you need to do is double flop the data um, or double register the data. So you have a a D flip-flop here. If you don't know what a D flip-flop is, you should review that. I have a video for that. Uh, review, so slow clock domain, data comes in, comes out on the Q output, and it goes straight into a flip-flop in the faster clock domain. The output of that flip-flop is going to be metastable. I have it there. The way to fix that is simply to add another register right after the metastable output and now you can guarantee that it almost guarantee for certain that it's stable it's like 99.999 percent probabilistic that it's going to be okay at that point so let's review how this is done so let's get into a code example for this so going from slow to a fast clock domain so i have some slow data and i have some slow pulse and i have a fast a fast clock domain so these are changing at the slow clock domain. Um, we don't need the slow clock in this particular module, but I'm just, this is just an example. So I have some intermediary signals here. Uh, this is VHDL, by the way, which is very similar to Verilog, but uh, I've been doing a lot of my examples in Verilog. I figured I'd give the VHDL guys a chance to see some code. So we have a process here, which is the same thing as an always block in Verilog, and it's at the fast clock domain. And we're looking at the rising edge, and we sample the slow data into R1 data. R1 data is going to be metastable, just like in this picture here. But that's okay. As long as we don't use R1 data in any of our logic elsewhere, we're good. All you need to do is take R1 data and sample that into R2 data, and now R2 is, is good to go. It's no longer metastable, you're stable. 
And you, if I search for R1 data here, you'll see the only places that it's used is right here. R2 data, however, can be used elsewhere in your code. Um, so um, another note about this is this is really handy for bringing data into your FPGA from an external source, like a pin, for example. If you have a, a pin that can be changing in the slow clock domain, which is really at any time, you just double flop it. You double flop all your inputs that are changing um, asynchronous to your clock, and then you can pretty much guarantee that they're stable. Uh, so this is the same, the same thing you do from a slow to a fast clock domain. You can do from uh, non-clocked input to any clocked input. Handy trick. Um, so here's another example where you might detect the, a rising edge. So let's say we have this slow pulse. Um, we have a slow pulse that is just a quick pulse in, in the slow clock domain, and we want to know when does that happen, in the, and we want to make a pulse in the fast clock domain. So the way we do that is sample the pulse. Again, R1 is going to be, um, R1 pulse is going to be metastable, but R2 pulse is going to be stable. So that's good, but you, R2 pulse doesn't give you enough just to detect the edge, because like, if it's like a multi-pulse, if R2 pulse is high for a, a couple different clocks, how do you know when the edge occurred? Like, let's say you go from um, a 10, 10 megahertz clock domain to 100 megahertz clock domain. You know, R1, R2 pulse is going to be high for like 10 clock cycles. So if you want to act on R2 pulse being high, you might act 10 times when only, you really only want to act one time. You want to act on the pulse just, just once for each pulse. So you're going to need to sample it one more time into R3 pulse. So you're looking for the scenario where R3 pulse is equal to zero and R2 pulse is equal to one. And that is the, by definition, the rising edge. And the reason is that R3 pulse is the old value and R2 pulse is the new value. So if the old value is zero and the new value is one, then you've gone from zero to one and that's your, pul that's your pulse in the fast clock domain. So now you can do stuff, you can do whatever you want. So that's scenario number one. Scenario number two is crossing from the fast to slow. So let's say you have a pulse um, that happens in 100, at 100 megahertz clocks and you have a 25 megahertz clock that you're trying to see that pulse. So how can you guarantee that you can see the 100 megahertz pulse in the 25 megahertz clock domain? Well, the only way to do it would be if this pulse lined up you know, right around here, around the 25 megahertz rising edge but there's no way to guarantee that this pulse is going to line up in the rising edge of the 25 megahertz, so you're going to miss it. It's pretty much guaranteed at some point you're going to miss that pulse. So how can you detect it? How can you detect this pulse in the 25 megahertz clock domain? Well, the answer is stretching. You need to stretch your fast signals to allow the slow clock, enough time for the slow clock to see them. So in this scenario, I have stretched out the 100 megahertz pulse by like some number of clock cycles, and we, the 25 megahertz rising edge comes along here, it doesn't see the pulse, so it goes low, it stays low, and it goes back high, and then boom, oh, I see it, and I'm gonna, now I'm gonna drive my 25 megahertz pulse high, and I'll pulse in the slow clock domain. So that's good, fix the problem. This does require knowledge of the fast clock domain and the slow clock domain because you need to know how many clock cycles you want to stretch the pulse for. So if you're going from 100 to 25, you need to stretch it by a good rule of thumb is, is the fast divided by the slow times two, uh, maybe plus one too, just for kicks. Uh, there's an, enough time that it sees it. I forget what I did in the code. Let me review that. Fast to slow. Yeah, I think I did zero to eight two times. Um, so if as long as you do two times the slow two times the slow clock domain, that number of clock cycles, uh, then you, you're, you should be good. So let's look at the code for how to cross from fast to slow. So I have a 100 megahertz clock coming in, I have a 25 megahertz clock, and I have a fast pulse, and I want to just detect that fast pulse. So this is a little bit more complicated here, because now I need to count and stretch things. So let's do that. So if so, in the in the 100 megahertz clock domain, if I see the pulse come along and it's one, then I'm going to set the count to eight, which is two times. So if you do fast divided by slow, 
fast divided by slow times two. That's the number of clock cycles that you should ensure that it's uh, that you're that you're stretching. And the reason is is that if it perfectly that's good enough to handle the worst case scenario. Okay, so you set R count to eight, and if R count is greater than zero, you're just going to decrement R count until it gets down to zero. So every time the pulse comes along, count's going to go to eight. Down, 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 down. And now we're going to combinationally set this W, this wire signal here. It's a W stretched. It's just a lookup table that's going to be set to one when R count is greater than zero, else it's going to be set to zero. So this is just going to be a nice long pulse for R count equal to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So eight clock cycles. That's nine. That's eight. Eight clock cycles. Then in your slow clock domain, this is all in the fast clock domain. Now in your slow clock domain, you're going to sample the stretched pulse. It's going to be metastable, and then you can just sample it again, and now it's a guaranteed stable. So now whenever this, whenever this pulse triggers, you know that you're, something should be triggering um, in your slow clock domain. And you can do the same thing we did in the previous example where you look at it twice to find like the rising, rising edge of the pulse if you just want to act on it one time, for example. Okay, so that's fast to slow. Now, let's talk about a whole bunch of data. So streaming. If you're streaming a lot of data from different clock domains, you're pretty much going to be using a FIFO. The previous examples are for like one-offs. If I get every now and then I get some data, I don't know how often it is, but I get some, or I get a pulse that's once every 10 clock cycles, or 20 clock cycles, something like that. That's easy to do with the previous code. If I have a ton of data, if I'm going from 33 megahertz to 50 megahertz, and I'm you know acting on uh, every single clock cycle, the only way to cross that boundary is going to be using a FIFO. Uh, FIFO is first in, first out, so it's a block, usually a block RAM. Inside your FPGA, you turn it into a dedicated piece of logic called a FIFO, and you use that to cross clock domains. And they're extremely useful for this purpose. I talked about it in the video I made about FIFOs, so check that out. And uh, it's a fantastic boundary. I created a video for it. There you go. Two rules that I talked about in the FIFO video is never read from an empty FIFO, never write to a full FIFO, and as long as those two rules are satisfied, you're going to be good. So you always need to ask yourself, will the, will the FIFO ever overflow or underflow? And so let me elaborate on that a little bit. If you're crossing from, let's say you're crossing from 33 megahertz to 50 megahertz. So you're going from slow to fast. You can send data on every single clock cycle in the 33 megahertz domain and get it in the 50 megahertz domain because the 50 is going to pull from the FIFO faster than you're pushing it in. Hope that makes sense. If, however, you're going from 50 to 30, the 50 is going to be generated. If you're generating data on every single clock cycle and you can't lose any of that data, you can't go to 30 megahertz. It's not going to work. What's going to happen is that your FIFO is going to slowly fill up, fill up, fill up, fill up, fill up. And if you don't give it a chance and stay like, okay, I'm going to, you're, you're almost full. I need to give you a chance to empty. The 50 megahertz is going to just keep writing data right into the FIFO and eventually it's going to have an overflow condition and your system's going to not be in good shape. That's a very bad thing. Always avoid it. So in that situation, the FIFO will overflow. Um, you want to be careful you don't do that. That's a bad idea. So in that scenario, you'd have to either have a faster clock domain on the output or you have to duty cycle the input data. So instead of giving it data on every single clock edge of the 50 megahertz, give it data on every other clock edge. Or give it data for a quick burst, give it 100 pieces of data, and then give it some time to recuperate and let the FIFO empty. And that's usually what happens, especially like video processing, things like that, where you'll, you'll take an entire row of video in and you'll allow that row to, to come into the system and then process it really quickly. Uh, and then get another row in, process it, get another row, process it. But there's dead time uh, on the, in video there's like an active part and there's an inactive part. The inactive part allows you some extra time to process the active part. So you, need, you either need some dead time or you need to speed things up. Timing errors. 
you will have timing errors. Timing errors are what happens when you run place and route. And the reason you're going to get these timing errors is that the tools don't know if you stretched your pulses correctly or if you double flopped your signals correctly. All they're going to see is I have a register that's operating at one clock frequency and that's directly tied to a register that's talking at a different clock frequency. That is by def my definition a metastable state. So I'm going to throw a timing error, my worst case timing error, and just say these aren't going to this isn't gonna pass timing. So you need to know why you have the errors. You need to know I'm going from 25 to 100 and that's okay because I stretched the pulse out, so I'm actually okay. So you need to write timing constraints to ignore errors. You know, always get timing errors to zero, which is your place and route score. You want zero timing errors, you want your score to be zero. If your score is not zero, you have a problem. Either you have a real timing error or you have a you just need to write a constraint that says don't worry about that i handled it you know timing ignore this ignore this problem right here don't worry about it and uh, i highly recommend you do that because you should always go uh, all your goal should always be a zero uh, zero timing errors during place and route that's it for crossing clock domains thanks very much for watching this video hope it was helpful if you want to support this channel, again, the best way to do so is to buy yourself a Go board and start tinkering around with that. I got lots of videos for it. It's a really fun piece of hardware, so thanks very much if you've already purchased one. If you haven't, go do it. Thanks.